Reservoir Dogs stars Tim Roth, Harvey Keitel, Chris Penn, Steve Buscemi, Lawrence Tierney, and Michael Madsen. It was written and directed by Quentin Tarantino and released February 6, 2007, and it runs 100 minutes. Quentin Tarantino's first major release is still one of the best crime thrillers ever made. Not only is the writing expertly done, so is the casting and the acting. The story revolves around a group of criminals after a botched heist of a diamond wholesalers. The majority of the film takes place at the criminal's rendezvous and somehow reminds me of watching a stage play, with the warehouse being the stage. At various points it cuts from the main story, going to the past to introduce individual characters while the heist was being planned, as well as the escape from the heist as goes bad. All in all, this is again a testament to Quentin Tarantino's ability to use one location for long periods of time, in a diner at the beginning, right before the heist, and in the warehouse. The conversations in the diner are very interesting, random conversations that will keep your attention and are sure to make you laugh. Mr. Brown's explanation of Madonna's Like a Virgin and Mr. White's reaction to Joe's rambling are priceless. Quentin Tarantino injects a bit of his love for music especially the 70s, into character dialogue. They talk about a fictional radio show called K. Billy's Super Sounds of the 70s when they talk in the diner. The radio show provides the soundtrack for the film with comedian Stephen Wright DJing the show. Harry Nilsson's song, Coconut, is used in a jarring contrast in tone. Some of the better known lines from the song are, put the lime in the coconut and drink it all up, and also, is there nothing I can take to relieve this belly ache? Because Mr. Orange gets shot in the belly, it's a small twisted joke towards the character situation. Mr. Pink and Mr. White, the first ones to get to the rendezvous, talk about and describe various incidents in the store during the robbery. But the clever thing is, they never show the actual robbery. They never show the inside of the store. You're left picturing for yourself how the inside of the store looks and how the events went down. It's one of those cases where less is more. Forcing me to use my imagination instead of showing every detail ended up drawing me into the film even further. There are some interesting cinematography shots, like watching a conversation take place in Joe's office from the outside looking in, making the viewer feel like they're listening to a private conversation. And this really cool close-up and distant shot that are at the same time in focus. Mr. Orange's apartment is decorated with some Marvel pictures and merchandise. And when he describes Joe Cabot to his buddy... You remember the Fantastic Four? Oh yeah, with that uh, invisible and uh, flame on and shit. Thing. Mother f Looks just like the thing. Freeze it! If you'll blink, you'll miss a Thing action figure on the coffee table. The connection Mr. White and Orange make throughout the film is reminiscent of good friends, or even father and son. They're hanging out, having drinks, discussing the heist, and of course, Mr. White takes care of Mr. Orange after he gets shot. That respect Mr. Orange has gained for Mr. White comes out at the end when he apologizes and reveals an important piece of information. For a movie full of badass, wisecracking criminals, it's kind of a sad moment when Mr. Orange decides to reveal his secret. There are more beefs than I thought there would be for a movie this good. First, there's a boom mic shadow in the warehouse while Joe is assigning names to the crew. There are a couple of points where characters step on each other's lines, reducing the dramatic effect. At the end of the scene where Mr. Blonde is torturing a police officer to K. Billy's super sounds of the 70s, the radio turns itself off, unless Mr. Orange shot it, along with shooting out the flame on Mr. Blonde's lighter, which would have fallen on some gasoline. The voices in the warehouse reverberate off the walls a little too much. It gives you a good sense of emptiness in the building, but it is a bit much. And at the end, when Mr. Pink leaves, we can hear the cops outside yelling at what I can only imagine is at him. The thing is, it's 1 minute and 13 seconds by the time he leaves to the time we hear the police yelling. you think he would have gotten further away in that time, 
What the heck was he doing out there? Overall, this is one of my favorite Quentin Tarantino movies. Usually earlier works from directors have a tendency to be less elaborate than their up-to-date work, but Reservoir Dogs is just as watchable as any of Tarantino's more recent films. 8.5 out of 10. Four perfect killers, one perfect crime. Critically acclaimed for its raw power and breathtaking ferocity, it's the brilliant American gangster movie classic from writer-director Quentin Tarantino. They were perfect strangers, assembled to pull off the perfect crime. Then their simple robbery explodes into a bloody ambush, and the ruthless killers realize one of them is a police informer. But which one? Special features. Playing it fast and loose, documentary. From the moment of its release in 1992, Reservoir Dogs has helped redefine modern cinema, an insightful study about the impact and ripple effect of this remarkable film. Profiling the Reservoir Dogs, featurette, a unique perspective into the criminal minds of the film's colorful characters. Hey, Joe, want me to shoot this guy? Shit. <laughs> you shoot me in a dream, you better wake up and apologize. <laughs> <laughs>